Hi, everyone. I'm Linda Rotenberg, the co-founder and CEO of Endeavor. Welcome to our sixth installment of Endeavor's Leading Through Crisis series. I'm really excited today to have Marcelo Claura here, who is the CEO of SoftBank International. He is the executive chair of WeWork, and he is an entrepreneur himself. So welcome, Marcelo. Thank you, and it's so nice to be here. Uh, I just saw on the screen somebody say, wow, such a beautiful background. <laughs> and, o o unlike all the Zoom background, this one is real. So there's a real background. It's not a Zoom background. I'm, I'm blessed to be in Colorado. So, uh, so this, just let everybody know, this is not a fake Zoom background. It's actually a real background. And we actually just opened Endeavor in Colorado. So we have some participants here uh, oh, from great. them. So Marcel, we want, I wanted, we have over 500 people joining us from nearly 40 markets. And for those who are not as familiar with your story, I thought we would start with you just sharing a bit about your background and then also weaving in how you got to know Endeavor. Great, but let me start by saying uh, how much uh, the amount of respect that I have for Endeavor. Uh, and I'll, I'll start by saying that you are an incredible uh, organization that just brings high quality entrepreneurs. And this is us just not talking and it is based on facts. And the reason why I say that is before I talked this morning, last night, as I couldn't sleep, I, I wrote a quick WhatsApp to my group and I say, I'm curious in what, one of the things that I do, and I'll talk a little about what I do, is my, my soft and Latin American fund. And so far, we have invested about $1.7 billion. And I was curious, and I said, what percent of our investment has gone to Endeavor Entrepreneurs? And 58% of our Latin American portfolio companies are Endeavor Entrepreneurs, which is fantastic. It's That's incredible. Amazing. And over 50% of the money that we have invested in Latin America, which is where we actually, you know, which is where we actually got started with Endeavor, is going to Endeavor Entrepreneurs. So we've done the largest investment uh, in Latin America. I think the largest venture investment ever made that was made to Rappi. We've invested in Quebec, in Madeira Madeira, in Clip, Walla, Cortex, Polanti, Vitex, Loft, Creditas, and all this. So I find it outstanding how when we, we got started, the, you know, the ability of this organization to basically gather the best in class. So that's fantastic. Uh, I'll give you a little of my story, right? I come from a very small country, probably the poorest country in Latin America called Bolivia. I was blessed to have parents who sent me to the U.S. to study, and they pretty much spent their lifetime savings by sending me to the U.S. As, as my father once told me that the, he, he can give me anything and I will spend, but the only thing that I would take from me forever would be my education. So he was determined to pretty much spend his life saving me, sending me to the U.S. to study. So. I was blessed to do that. I went back to Bolivia, uh, like most Latin American students who go to the U.S. And on my plane back to Bolivia, I had a chance to meet a, back then a person by the name of Guido Loaiza, who had just gotten elected to be the president of the Bolivian Soccer Federation. Uh, and he told me his plans were to take Bolivia to the World Cup, which for those of you who understand soccer, it's almost impossible for Bolivia to make it to the World Cup because we get to play against Brazil, we get to play against Argentina, we get to play against Uruguay, so teams that are significantly better than us. But he had a very clear idea of what needed to be done, how to leverage our competitive advantage, known as altitude. We play at 13,000 feet, so, and, you know, how to put a serious plan, in you know, a work plan on how we're going to get that done. So by the time I landed in Bolivia, he convinced me to join him as his right-hand person to be the I remember my title, international manager of the Bolivian Soccer Federation, because the federation was broke. You know, my salary was zero. As a matter of fact, we had to pay for everything. So my, my parents were a little bit upset. They said, we just spent our lifetime savings sending you to study, and you're going to get a job in football or in soccer that doesn't pay you any money. But uh, we had a dream. You know, we, against all odds, you know, I like to say that, you know, we like to do the impossible. Against all odds, we basically took Bolivia, qualified Bolivia to the World Cup for the first time in, in my country's history. And that taught me that, you know, pretty much everything is achievable. So I got lucky with that. After that, uh, I went back to the U.S. Uh, I, I bought my first cell phone shop. Uh, I bought it by mistake. You know, I walk into a store and, and the owner of the store was a uh, was very upset that he had, he had to work on that day because uh, his, his retail person didn't show up and he asked me, 
if I knew anybody that could buy his two stores he had. And I told him my story about Bolivia. So I convinced him. And by the end of my meeting, he basically, I wanted to buy a cell phone. By the time I walked out, I ended up buying a new company that actually owned 50%. So it was no money down. It was all loan. And uh, we did quite good. We became the largest uh, independent retailer in the Northeast from all the way from Maine up down to North Carolina. And then, you know, I sold it a year, year and a half later. And I was shocked, you know, and, and this is why I love this country. You know, it's the American dream. You come in, you work hard and you sell. You know, I sold my first business. And what I learned there is that it was really, really difficult to get mobile phones. You know, the two distributors that existed called Pripoint and Cellstar were terrible. They, they shipped stuff wrong. And they were never on time. Just, they were just terrible. So by the time I sold my business, I say, if these two, they were pretty large, two very large $10 billion publicly traded companies. I said, if they are so bad, you know, I got to be able to beat them. So I took the best of their names. One was Brightpoint, the other was Cellstar, and I started a company called Brightstar. And my goal was to provide excellent distribution services in Miami. So my goal was to be the number one in Miami, and we did that. Then we went to Latin America. We became the number one in Latin America. Then we came into the U.S. market. We became number one in the U.S. And then we replicated our business model. And we open in 51 countries all over the world, in Asia, in Europe, in India, in Australia. And we became the largest wireless distribution company ever. You know, we reached about $10 billion in sales. We became something that was really unique for me, which was the largest Hispanic business ever. So, and being a Hispanic, being a Latino, that was a lot of pride. And it was really nice to basically beat these two companies. So... That was really fun. I was an entrepreneur. I built it. I raised money like like a lot of the entrepreneurs. It was a lot harder to raise money back then. Uh, my my industry wasn't too sexy. Distribution. I evolved the business from distribution to supply chain to <clears throat> e-commerce to insurance and so on. So that was a very nice success story. And for me, it was it was very nice to build a number one in the world. You know, very few times do we have a chance. But it was also important for a Latin American company to basically become number one in the world, I mean, number one in the U.S. So I thought, you know, I was very happy. I, I thought I was going to keep that business forever and my kids were going to work on it like, like everybody that has those dreams until, you know, life is full of this, this moment, inflection points. So until, until I showed up in Japan to basically go convince, everybody has talked to me about this crazy Japanese entrepreneur who was turning around SoftBank and I, I went and I had a chance to meet Masa and I presented Brightstar to him. And at the end, he said, he said, oh my God, we are the same. He says, I am a Korean entrepreneur who came to Japan and basically I built a really good business. I said, you're a Bolivian entrepreneur who went to the U.S. and built an amazing business. He says, we should do a lot of business together. So he started giving me some business and obviously I, I executed perfectly. And then out of the blue, you know, Massa buys Sprint in the U.S., which was the largest acquisition, largest investment by a Japanese company ever. I think it was $26 billion. And then he calls me, says, hey, you know, I, we bought a Sprint. I have an idea for you. I said, what is it? He says, why don't we unite all the, all the phones that you buy at Brightstar, all the phones that I buy at SoftBank, and now all the phones that we buy at, at Sprint. And why don't we create a buying company? And in the spirit of Massa, who loves to think big, and he says, hey, if we unite our procurement, we're the largest buying company in the world. And we were. And he says, and I want you to be the CEO of that while you still run your little business called Brightstar. And for me, that was a very important moment because suddenly I became from being a distributor, which is, I mean, we're like sort of like second class. We're always begging to be in the middle and all that to now becoming the largest buyer in the world. And I always joke that, I remember when I had to go to Korea to visit Samsung, I had to beg for them to see me. I'm like, please, you know, can I? And now, you know, I had the CEO and chairman of Samsung begging to sell those phones because I control the largest procurement company in the world in the mobile phone industry. So it was fun. Uh, we delivered incredible results. And then Massa invited me to join the Sprint board, which to me, you know, for a lot of entrepreneurs who are listening, that's an intimidating moment. I mean, Sprint was an, the company founded in 1899. It's an American iconic company. It's one of the largest, the ninth largest telco in the world. 
And I've never, I had no idea what was a public company board, how I was going to feel. I was like, like, I don't know, like, a, like the first time as a kid when I went to Disney World, that excitement, those butterflies in my stomach was walking to a spring boardroom and everything was so formal. I'm like, oh my God, finally, I'm, a, I'm in a board of a public traded company. And then I realized that, that Sprint was run terrible. It was, it, and and uh, we were in the middle of buying T-Mobile and the government told Massa that we couldn't buy T-Mobile. So Massa pulled me aside to a room and he told me, you know, I'm in trouble now because if they don't let us buy T-Mobile, Sprint was in dire straits, very close to bankruptcy. They haven't been able to do much. He says, I have an idea. I, I said, what is it? He said, why don't you become CEO of Sprint? I said, I can become CEO of Sprint for two reasons. Number one, I have my company called Brightstar. He says, don't worry about that. He says, let's call Goldman, figure out how much it's worth, and I will buy it from you. I said, okay, problem one solved. I said, but problem two, which is a lot more serious, is how we, I, would, I don't know how to run a telco. This is way above my pay grade. You know, this is a, another level. This is technology. By, by the way, hard. I spent six years on the board of Zao, which is the largest independent fiber group. So we could geek out on telco yeah. and 5G and whether that's real. But I love that you, I, I, yeah. I, I love that you were part of that. Zao, yeah, I know the guys at Zao quite well. Uh, so, you know, he says, look, you're a street fighter like me. I'll teach you the technology. And then I said, great, let's do it. So I showed up, this Bolivian guy from Miami shows up to Kansas City, Missouri, to live in Kansas City, Kansas, because there's two, basically to go run Sprint. And it was a big shock, you know, to the 70,000 employees who had traditionally been run by traditionally white Anglo-Saxon uh, <clears throat> conservative telecom executives, corporate America, suit. I remember for me to go to my office the first day, I had to go through seven checkpoints of security and assistance and all that. And I, it was intimidating. So first thing I did is I said, get me the hell out of this office. I just put me in a cube with the rest of employees. It was just too quiet for me. And in a very short period of time, we put, we put together a very clear plan for, for Sprint, how to change the brand. And we went from, you know, having the worst brand to having, you know, a very, a, a really good brand from losing millions of customers to gaining millions of customers, from losing you know five billion dollars in free cash to actually becoming net income profitable and <clears throat> and generating free cash, and we fixed a company. We fixed a company that's in total dire straits that was three months away from bankruptcy, uh, and it was fascinating. It was fascinating. How do you earn the trust of seventy thousand employees? How do you change a brand? How do you reignite growth? So, and then I came up with the idea that the only way we were going to be able to beat AT&T and Verizon was to merge with T-Mobile. And that was the most daunting merger ever because it had been tried three times and it had been declined three times. But I thought that this time was going to be different because if we could unite these two mavericks and combine our spectrum and make a commitment to the U.S. that we're going to create jobs, not, not destroy jobs, and that we're going to bring competition to Comcast and to Charter, who pretty much do a disastrous job of providing terrible customer service and charge an outrageous amount of money for broadband. You know, we started this with, a, with another maverick, with John Leger, who we didn't like each other too much, but now we became best friends in the merger. And we said, we're going to do this. And the chances of getting this merger approved, when I asked my lawyers on day one, was 1%. And I said, we're going to get it done. We're, we're history of, of, of making stuff happen that's not supposed to happen. And systematically, you know, we got the DOJ, Department of Justice, we got the FCC. And when we thought we were celebrating and hugging each other and said, we have done what not supposed to do, we had the lawsuits from the attorney generals, which is the first time since 1940 that an attorney general has tried to stop a, a merger. And then the stakes were very, very high because if an attorney general had the ability to stop a merger, you know, if, some, if an attorney general wakes up in Mississippi one day and says, I want to stop a merger, then every merger could be stopped. So the odds were high, not only because of the telecom merger, but for the future of mergers in America. And we prepared and we had congressional hearings where Congress, where Congress people just beat us up. 
and we had to go to trial for the first time. And I'll tell you, that was another moment, like walking to the first. At those moments, I said, those butterfly moments, like walking to the boardroom of Sprint, walking into Congress to be grilled by senators. It was another one of those wow, aha moments. We went to a lawsuit, uh, lawsuit and we actually won the lawsuit. And then we actually now did the merger, which is a, it's about a $200 billion merger, which makes it one of the largest mergers ever consummated. Wow. Okay, here I am now as CEO of SoftBank International. So I'll, I'll stop talking because I, I think I talked <laughs> Well, luckily, well, this was great. And um, by the way, back to your soccer stories. We always ask our entrepreneurs for an ungoogleable fact about them, right? So my ungoogleable fact is that in 1994, I basically got, um, was, I lived 10 minutes from the Argentine soccer team, national. So I went to every practice and I became the unofficial guide of all the Argentine journalists. And a year later, when I ba went back to Buenos Aires and my friend Wood Staten, who took all of McDonald's Latin America public, he was having the first kind of um, Ronald McDonald House uh, charity event, but Ma Maradona, it was the last time he was playing because of his ban. And so all of the, the major journalists came and all of a sudden they, see, they saw me on the field and they say, mira, es la chica de Boston. So that is my <laughs> <laughs> claim to fame. So that's, that's 1994, <laughs> huh? That, that yeah. was the year that we took Bolivia to the World Cup and uh. we were so lucky that not only did we qualify Bolivia for the first time in history, but we got to open the World Cup. If I'm not mistaken, June 26, 1994, Soldiers Field was Bolivia, Germany. So uh, Amazing. Yeah, we have a big love for, for soccer. I love that. So um, we have... Uh, over 80 questions already submitted, which was amazing. And it was fun to see the, the themes. And I think um, we'll start sort of chronologically and move into the, where you left off. But, but I guess as, as a founder, um, what, looking back, uh, I think you talked about your proudest moment, which is becoming number one which is in the world, which is an unbelievable, we tell our entrepreneurs to think big, but that's an unbelievable uh, achievement. But Looking back, what is, if you could have a do-over, what was the biggest mistake you made as a founder? So th there, is, there are a few mistakes, right? And, 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 and this is going to sound contrary to what a lot of entrepreneurs do. Is you, you have this fear of failure that you're not going to be able to grow your business and then you take private equity money too early, too expensive, uh, because you're scared of the future. And you say, you know, hey, if somebody's willing to give me, I remember the first time I raised money for Brister was, I think, like $300 million. First of all, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was pulling my hair and say, oh my God, somebody paid $300 million for 20 something percent of my business. Was well, like, like an oh my God moment. But it was done more out of fear, you know, that, that fear we got to have enough cash in the bank just in case things go wrong and all that. And I think I, I see a lot of entrepreneurs today who are just trying to raise money and, and, and they have become, uh, and, and I did that for a little while. I, be, I became so good at doing decks. I became so good at doing pitches and we shouldn't, right? We should just focus on running a great business, building a great business, be, understand that the only way a business will be sustainable is not on growth. It's on your ability to generate cash. So all these high valuations based on these hockey sticks plants and all that. And I did that for a little while. And I was lucky. I raised money. And thank God my business you know, exploded. But if I could do it different, I would try to raise less money. I would try to manage my cash better. So therefore, the value at the end is great. I mean, I see it a lot with entrepreneurs today who, you know, I won't say the name of an entrepreneur, but I said, God, you build an amazing business. How much? What percent of your business do you own? It's like 3%. And I'm like, that's crazy. You know, you, you should. And, and, and in many cases, entrepreneurs are doing this just because it's become great. Let's go raise money. Let's have these high valuations. And let's just do it based on growth. So that was, you know, I would say that was a big mistake that, that I made. I, I would have loved by the time I sold it to Massa to own 90 something percent. I only own 73%, which is quite good. That's incredible. To, we we uh, see so many cap them. tables that, that are so, where the entrepreneurs are yeah. so diluted even after the first round of financing. Yeah. 
Um, well, that's interesting. I, I'm, I'm going to come back to the financing later because obviously people have a lot of questions. But one of the questions there was, you just answered it, whether you think entrepreneurs sometimes should turn down money or or take less money. So you've basically answered answer your own question. And I think take, take the amount of take the amount of money that you need. And I understand country because on one side I'm one of the largest tech investors in the world, but uh, you know life has taught us lessons. So therefore, I mean, it's a it's a it's take the amount of money that you need, use debt instead of equity if you can. If you have a Has great an entrepreneur business, ever would... come to you in this in this soft bank and said, "I want I want less money. I want to I want to." I mean, how do you, how have you handled that when you're on the other side? Many times, and 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 I'll tell you, and I'm I'm very blunt about it. Right, I said one of the lessons that we've learned at the Vision Fund, which we were investing at the tune of a billion dollars a week, was. Sometimes we push entrepreneurs too much for too much growth and too much money. And we learn our lesson, right? Uh, we have made a point to deploy capital at an accelerated pace. So, you know, you know we learned our lesson and now, it's, it's, now it's, we've adapted, we've learned. And now we just provide entrepreneurs with the amount of money that they need. On the other side, you have too many entrepreneurs who want to raise too much money you know, to try to figure out what they do with the money later. And that's a mistake. And when, when, there was a world, when there was a world where there were so many people fighting for that entrepreneur, then the entrepreneur could get away with that. So it just, you know, it's, it's a balance, I would say. Yeah, I think that's why these periods of reset are actually good right? Because you get yeah. to focus on the fundamentals. So let's go back to your stories, which are really about taking over at Sprint. And now really with what you've done at WeWork, and there were a lot of questions around culture and how you, um, as, as sort of an outsider coming in, what do you do to, on the one hand, retain this entrepreneurial energy, which maybe at Sprint had actually been lost, but on the other hand, where cultures need to shift. How do you, how do you make that change and have, bring the team and the stakeholders along with you? So I'll give you two examples, right? And I'll tell you about a Sprint. Sprint, if, imagine 1890, a company 120 years old, a very, very uh, traditional company, 70,000 employees got used to losing, got used to getting their butts kicked every day. It was okay to lose 2 million customers, 3 million customers. I always tell people, it's like, you know, there's a basketball team in the NBA that they know they have no chance to make it to the playoffs. Zero chance, right? And you just show up to work and you give it your best effort, but you've learned to lose. And that was sprint. And here I come and I say, I'm the opposite. I, say, I said, oh my God, I can't lose. I'm, I used to go and bang my head against the wall every night. I said, oh my God, we're losing customers. And then we started teaching people how to win, right? We, and, and the feeling, the flavor, the, the mood, the smiles, the, the self-confidence when you teach people winning little battles. And then you, and a year later, we were beating Verizon and AT&T quarter after quarter after quarter, taking their customers. And it was a joy. And then you build a world where we set a very, very clear plans of what we needed to do with Sprint. And then you create a culture of people that were well aligned, a culture where people started to having fun, a culture of good, where we basically did the largest corporate grant as it relates to the internet ever. We gave away 1 million laptops and 1 million free devices to underserved kids uh, that didn't have access to the internet at home and they couldn't do their homework, and they were mainly Blacks and Hispanics. And everybody rallied behind the One Million Project. So suddenly, I went to a campus where we have a beautiful, beautiful campus in Kansas City, where you used to walk, and people used to put their head down to people high-fiving you, to people feeling the pride. You know, I remember that day a lady approached me and said, you look, your sprint is so important in Kansas City. They say, before, when I used to leave Kansas City, I used to hide my badge. Now I'm so proud to wear my badge where I go everywhere. So it was fascinating. It was amazing how we transformed a bureaucratic entity to a highly entrepreneurial where we thought people or launches don't have to be perfect, right? You know, I remember one day I say the best way to mess with AT&T and Verizon is we're going to launch a campaign, cut your bill in half. You know, bring me your bill. And we used to, if people had to bring their bill, they had to bring a pair of scissors 
and they used to cut their bill in our stores and in exchange, we used to give them 50% off. And I remember the IT people used to say, look, this is going to take about a year of IT work and, and, all, and all that. And I said, well, it's going to take a day. I said, even if we need to enter manually and do a quick spreadsheet where they say, well, the sales people are going to rip us off. They're going to put different numbers. I said, no, just open one field in the CRM and all they put a bill. And we trust our sales people to say, I saw a bill that was $90 and now it's going to be 45. And then in the back office, you guys figure out. And we thought people that was okay to innovate, to experiment and to do it fast. You know, we thought uh, uh, like everything doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, and, and we got to learn how to fail fast. You know, I came with an idea called direct to you call and we will deliver phones to your house with somebody setting them up. Well, it's total failure because the demand was so big. We didn't have enough cars and all that. So we fell fast. So that was great for a company like Sprint. Then you go into WeWork and that's a, a whole different thing. So I was the one in charge of basically going in, bailing WeWork out of trouble and then sort of acting as a de facto CEO. You know, so I have to, uh, and I had to take over after a big personality called Adam Newman uh, and a company that people have been living in a fake dream, right? Somehow they yeah. thought they were the world's most valuable startup. Uh, the financial projections were a little aggressive. And it was a culture of shock where you had, they have hired like 16,000 employees in one year. And everybody had been led to believe that there was going to be this aha moment called an IPO and that everything that they were doing was great. So you have all these kids in their 20s who were living this dream and then suddenly have to show up and say, I'm sorry to cut the news, but hey, there's no way there's an IPO. And we have to do a massive, massive restructuring. And we have to basically get out of buildings and we have to retrench from this craziness of growth at all cost, And it was hard because employees used to come to me and, I, and they were all paper millionaires. And they all came to us and say like, what did I do wrong? I did everything right. they asked me to do. I opened a thousand buildings. Exactly. I mean, if you, think in the, if you think in the history, there had something like that had never been done. So it is basically, that has been a whole different treatment in terms of explaining people a new reality, applying the same logic as Sprint, you know, putting together a very clear plan now to, re to put WeWork into profitability for the first time ever. And now we have a very aligned group of people with a very aligned culture in terms of, in terms of what is it that we're going to go do next. One of the questions that's come up here, and it's come up really on every one of these Leading Through Crisis uh, episodes, is you know, we have a lot of entrepreneurs who are having to deal with reduction in workforce, and they're saying, how do you motivate the people who are staying when, in your case, not only are they no longer the paper millionaires they thought they were going to be, or it's going to take much longer to achieve any sort of liquidity, but on, on the other side, the people who used to be at the cubicle next door or in the, you know, the floor below next door are, are, are gone. How do you kind of rally the troops after delivering tough news? So one of the things that I've learned is at a sprint, at a sprint, we have to let go of 30,000 people. Wow. And first thing we had to do was be incredibly honest and vulnerable to your employees. You know, I've learned one thing. When I went to Sprint, I said, look, this is very, this is very, very simple. We lose $5 billion a year because we're spending $5 billion too much. So we're going to have to let go of 30,000 people. And it's not that the people that we're letting go, it's not that you're bad. It's not your fault. It's the fault that we need to adjust the business because what you're doing when we let you go is because we're going to go save a business. There's a bigger cause here. And I felt that by being incredibly honest with people and transparent and letting them know exactly what you're going to do and always treat people with dignity when you're letting people go, with dignity, with respect. You know, spring, anytime we let people go, people used to walk through the corridors and everybody used to stand up and basically clap them on their way out. And, and I used to, in many cases, that we were stand outside, basically speaking to people, we're letting them go. Every employee is watching your actions, and you got to you got to lead by example, right? I mean, at a spring they had this stupid practice that the days that they were letting people go, the executives stay at home. I said it's the opposite. The executives would be here, we're going to show our face. And as you do these reductions in force, one is importantly to communicate and overly communicate. But then the people that are staying 
are the people that you basically have to treat them better, explain that they, they have been the ones that have been selected to stay. And again, be very honest. And I think overly communicate in terms of what is it that you're trying to achieve. And if you do that, you'll be amazed, right? I mean, people thought, hey, after you let go of 30,000 people in sprint, you're not going to be able to walk on campus. That's a lie. People will always respect you if you basically explain them why you're doing this yeah. and what is the goal you're trying to achieve. And just treat people with dignity and respect and make sure you help people on their way out. And if you have the financial means, make sure you communicate with other companies that are hiring. Because in this world, there's adjustments. While people are hiring, while laying off, other people are hiring. I love that feedback, and I've been joking that my new title is COCO, Chief Over Communications Officer. So I love your, yeah. your feedback. Um, you know, uh, you've answered a lot of questions in terms of the, the culture and team. That's great. And I, I think the other, you've also, um, I think rightly stated that it was never really growth at all cost, right? And and now people are believing that there's this sudden shift only to profitability. And, 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 and obviously every case is somewhat different, right? But I think a lot of entrepreneurs are looking for new KPIs. And so I think they wanted to know both for your portfolio companies, but also for yourself at WeWork, how is it only the path to profitability? How, what, what in terms of KPIs and sort of knowing you're on the right track track are, are you sort of using in this new world? So, you know, I'm privileged to lead or have a portfolio companies that together they amount to over $400 billion, ranging from all sorts of companies, you know, total startup, a bosser in Brazil who is disrupting how people move themselves in Brazil. Yeah, we I hope they become an endeavor a entrepreneur. <laughs> a, couple, a couple of million dollars to... You know, we have Alibaba, right? In which, uh, you know, I think our value in Alibaba this week is $140 billion, right? There, no two businesses are cut the same. And, 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 and I think, you know, every business has a different set of KPIs. Every business has a different life cycle and every business has different needs. But there's one thing that we can never lose track. The value of the businesses are predicated upon your ability to generate cash flow, whether it's in present, whether it's in the future. So there's a lot of businesses that were happy to finance their growth, that were happy to finance that they want to gain market share, that we want to, we're happy to finance if they're going to be the leader in their market. But always there needs to be a very clear plan in terms of what does it take? Are the unit economics solid? Meaning we're investing in growth because the moment we stop the growth, the business is going to generate cash. I think the days of business of, hey, let me just invest so you gain market share and we later figure out how we're going to generate cash. I think those are businesses that are very few are going to be able to make it happen. I'll give you an example. Probably the most successful investment ever made in history is our investment in Alibaba, right? How do you turn mm -hmm. 20 million into 100 million? I knew Jack Ma when he was the English teacher, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and Jack, you know, Jack and Massa. And it was Massa's vision that basically called Jack Look, don't worry about charging anything for now. Just basically become this marketplace where, you know, don't charge people to create that demand. And once you have a lot of market power, you can start charging. But there was, we always, or they always knew, I should not say we, because I was not involved. They always knew that once you get so much market power, you can basically start charging for services. But again, you were the only e-commerce player in China e-commerce was new, the market was thriving, so there were different times. Now, on the other side, there's one thing for sure, is you should never be scared to grow if you know you're going to become the market, play, the, the market leader. Because even in coronavirus times, the companies that are going to thrive and survive are going to be the market leaders. So there's a specific, uh, there's a, there's specific handicap or specific... Uh, advantage that you have when you're the market leader than in times where the economy is growing, you're going to grow faster. And in times when the economy is suffering, you're going to survive while your competitors are going to go out of business. So my advice is, you know, grow as fast as you can, gain as much market share as you can, but make sure your unit economics are solid and make sure that if something goes wrong, you can stop the growth and start generating cash. 
Great. Okay. Last question on financing, which is that, and I'll give you my perspective, Endeavor Catalyst had its busiest month this past month. Um, in a, so we are not seeing a slowdown for great companies. But I think a lot of people just would love you to prognosticate in terms of, let's talk about the next year. Is it go, what is the fundraising environment going to be? And what's your advice to entrepreneurs who are seeking capital at this point? So there is money. There's plenty of money out there, right? I mean, if I, and I, I talk a lot about Latin America because we have a 5 billion technology fund in Latin America. And in the middle of this crisis, we continue to fund businesses and, and uh, every single term sheet that we had out there, you know, we'll fund it and we'll continue to fund it. And, and we're always looking for great businesses. And, and throughout SoftBank, you know, I, you know, there's not a month that doesn't go by that we don't do five, six, seven, eight investments into companies or that we're doing follow-ons and all that. The only thing that has changed is I think there's less competition today. People are, the venture community is a little more reserved. And therefore, the power of the entrepreneur to play venture capital firm against each other in order to get higher valuations in better terms, I think that's going to slow down a little bit. Because I think I think the venture companies are the venture investors have slowed down a little bit, but I go back. If you have a great business that is growing, that is solving a problem, that's participating in a big industry, there's always going to be money, and you should not time your 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 fundraising. You should basically go raise money whenever you need it to execute the business plan that you set forward. So, so if you have a good business that is showing that you're generating, you know, whatever KPIs you're driving through, generating the growth or the profitability or, or the market share growth, there's plenty of money out there. I mean, so I, I don't, I don't see, I don't, I don't see a, you know, I don't see that changing where, where there's going to be no money is just that money just for growth sake, for the sake of growth. Mm -hmm. That's going to, that, that has stopped. And that, that's a, that's a big message to entrepreneurs is the money saying, Hey, you know, I got a million new customers a month and I don't know when I'm going to be profitable and don't worry, I'll figure out five years later. I think that's over. Now, now you just set up this $100 million opportunity growth fund. Shunayet is going to, to, to lead that. Uh, there, obviously, um, Endeavor and every business around the world has had discussions in the wake of the George Floyd murder and uh, just people feeling like it is time to, for a change. And we know the venture industry, historically only, at least in this country, only 2% of, of venture money has gone to women, only 1% to black founders. Um, talk us through the decision to create this Opportunity Growth Fund. Um, I know you also have the Emerge Accelerator, but also whether you think this is going to be a turning point for the, the, the venture and private equity industries going forward. Are we going to see more female and non-white founders being funded yeah so let me give you a story first of all racism is everywhere in the u.s and i leave that as a, as a latin american as a you know i was having a, i'll, I'll have a, when as soon as i announced the fund i'll tell you a funny story i got a call from a, a guy called virgin Abloh, virgil Abloh, who's basically the creative designer at lvmh and he's black and he writes and he says holy cow i've been reading your story and stories like yours or mine are not supposed to happen. He says, the black guy like me is not supposed to be the creative director of LVMH. Not supposed to happen. It's a French company. I says, a Hispanic guy like you is not supposed to be the person who managed this much amount of money, so we got to collaborate. And we started talking, and we figure the only reason why this happened, I have this theory that two things happen. One is people get caught on camera today. But this sort of stuff that we saw what happened right. with the, this tragic death? This happens every day. It happens everywhere. It happens to Latinos. It happens to right. black. The only difference is cell phones. To, Back to your old business. This is like literally the, the only, only difference. difference yeah. Is cell phones. And then secondly, people have been locked up in their houses for a very long period of time. So, so when and people accumulate this anxiety, this and and when these two things combine, is what this caused a movement that I think people, everyone, basically say enough is enough. Change needs to happen. And I'm sitting, I'm watching TV and I'm, and, and I'm watching my Twitter account and I see all these companies putting, oh, I am behind the black community or, you know, I stand behind you. And I said, that, that's all just cheap talk. 
Everybody just talked. It's easy to say, I stand behind it. Everybody's issuing this statement. And I said, you know, I started getting data about, you know, venture back companies for black and Hispanics. I call them entrepreneurs of color. And there was nothing. It's a joke. Yeah. I think the largest fund was like a 40 million fund. So that, so I picked up the phone. I called Massa. I said, Massa, I want to do something. I want to open a hundred million fund just to fund entrepreneurs of color. And then he said, go for it. So in less than 24 hours, Amazing. we put it together. I called two African-American friends that are total rock stars, Stacey Brownfield, but who's the yep. CEO of Task Rabbit, and Paul Judge, who's an amazing yep. investor. I said, guys, let's do this. And then in less than 24 hours, we launched a fund. We announced the fund. And oh my God, my, and, and I'm doing an interview on CNBC. And people say, how can I send my plans? I said, it's easy, Marcelo at softbank.com. Mm-hmm. You have no idea the amount of requests, the amount of. So I we love are, this. We want so, Endeavor, We want you to send them through Endeavor because our peer peer to peer network is incredible. Yeah. Uh, you know, forty countries around the world, but we all need to do better. We all need to participate in changing these yeah. numbers, as you said. The data so, is appalling. Yeah, but the thinking is, it was here, right? You know, what can I do to help this movement? And, and everyone has a way to do it, right? You know, my my twelve year old daughter. Uh, we're sitting here in Colorado and she says, dad, I want to go to a protest. I said, great. So on Sunday, she's with her sign protesting and that's her way to contribute. And right. what can I do to contribute? I'm, I'm blessed and privileged to be part of SoftBank and I'm privileged to be able to be able to make a decision that says, I want to do a hundred million fund and do it in 24 hours. So that's my contribution. And the message to everybody is, you know, if each one of us can use whatever assets or whatever superpower we have, to basically just do a little contribution. My daughter is protesting. That's her contribution. Mine is to open a hundred million fund. And after we have announced, you know, Andreessen Horowitz, Goldman Sachs, everybody started launching these funds. So my goal is can hundred million change this? No, it will help. But if everybody follows what I did, which is a lot of people that did, now then we're going to start getting volume and then hopefully that's going to be your contribution to change this movement. I and my that. message to everybody was, you know, talk less and do more. You know, everybody today is a, it's fashionably right to talk about racism and all that, but every one of us should be doing something about it. Totally. And do something, I love what you said, in your superpowers, right? So this is what we've said. Our, our superpower is a trust-based, peer-to-peer, entrepreneur-first network. So anyway, we would love to see some of those entrepreneurs so we can help them when they're scared to negotiate against you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this, this, one, this, one, this, this one is a little bit different because all of the profits, all of the returns are going to be used to reinvest on fund two and then fund yeah. two into fund three. No, and, well, that's like I the Endeavor you, Catalyst Fund, right? Or, right, exactly. Yeah, I, got, I got that idea from you guys. Exactly. We'll take credit. Exactly. We're the pioneers of that. We get credit for that one. Our re- Alan, our, our reinvestment fund uh, that comes from the profits. Um, Okay, so this is great, Marcel. A lot of people now want you to go into prognostication mode. And I think, you know, many of us, I'm working from my home office, and, and I think your perspective at WeWork is so unique in terms of looking at the future of work. And, and what are you discussing within WeWork in terms of how office buildings are going to change? A lot of people, you know, are waiting for their kids to go to school. As we said, the one thing that needs to be disrupted is Zoom is fantastic. Zoom schooling, not so fantastic. So we still need work there, ask any parent. But I think that while some people are waiting to get you know, out of the house, a lot of people want, like, want to go where they don't have to take transportation. They, they'd like to work closer. A lot of people don't want to go with big elevators. Are you thinking about transforming WeWork into sort of Zoom rooms and different sort of collaboration centers where really, I'm really interested to hearing your, your thoughts on this broader new normal in terms of work. First, you know, let's tackle WeWork, right? And I always tell people, there is, it's funny, now you go to any meeting and everybody talks, you know, pre-WeWork and post-WeWork as to how the venture capital has worked, has worked. And the reason why I took this job was to jump, to jump into fixing WeWork is because we need to prove that this was a good business, it was a great business, a great idea, and we're going to fix it and we're going to turn it around to make sure that the post we work is great. And by next year, the company is going to be profitable. The year after the profit, the company is going to be generating free cash flow and it's going to be an amazing turnaround story. Okay. Number two, always remember post, post-crisis, 
the, the leaders emerge even, even bigger and better. So the good thing is in the middle of the crisis, a lot of our competitors who were not properly funded are not going to come out as strong as we are going to come out. So we work for all of those that worry, because I saw some of the questions I see them pop up. Is, can you turn around WeWork? Is WeWork fixable? WeWork is an incredible business and absolutely is going to be fixed, no doubt. Now let's move us to what happens after the crisis. What, what are we learning? We've learned one is that we're capable of doing most of the amount of work at home. And, and that stuff that we thought we could never do, we're capable of doing it. And in many cases, we're, we're able of doing it better than before. However, the social contact is still important. To, to sit in groups where you can brainstorm is important. And we, as humans, we like to, have a, we like to be part of a community. You know, we don't like to be sitting alone in an apartment or sitting alone in a room. So somehow these two things have to coexist in a world where there is going to be the need for social distancing <clears throat> until we find a test and, and proper vaccine. So what we found is that the demand for WeWork is stronger than ever, right? And for that, WeWork has redesigned most of its buildings. So therefore, basically in our common areas, now there's social distancing. We've marked up where you can sit, where you know, we've eliminated certain things that basically congregated people. And what most of our companies are asking us is they say, look, we want to make sure that our employees have the ability to go to one of your offices and we have, we have to give them the ability that they can work out of headquarters, work out of satellite offices, or work out of their home. And what is happening is we're starting to open a lot of new buildings in satellite places where, for example, they're used to, you will never find a WeWork in a suburb. Well, now we're opening WeWork in suburbs. Right. So you can go to your headquarters, to your, you can go to your HQ, but then most corporate employ, employees are basically telling us, sell us memberships and open new buildings close to where our employees live. So they can go in and exactly. have a meeting. So they can go into a conference room and, uh, you know, and, and be able to work away from home because they need to be away from home because they need to be in a quiet place. Uh, a lot of companies don't know how big they're going to be. So, how, so they're not willing to sign long-term leases. So therefore, they're all coming to WeWork. So I think the future of work is going to be one in which we're going to leverage what we learned that we're capable of doing work at home. The future of the headquarters are going to be diminished. There will be headquarters, but there won't be the need for everybody to be in the same place at all time. And the need for satellite offices yeah. or hub and spoke model is what we think is going to happen. So does this change, uh, yes, the smart cities approach? I mean, have you, I'm sure you're talking with Dara a lot about Uber and its plans. If people are, you know, we've talked about smart cities for a while, assuming the cities are where all the action is going to happen. If, if people are going to work closer to home, does that shift everything from the food delivery, the transportation? Are we going to reimagine sort of our, our city to suburb to rural area? You know, the, yes, I mean, everything changes. Right. Uh, I mean, when you look what Facebook basically said is you can work. Why Facebook used to force every employee to move to San Francisco. Now Facebook is saying, go work wherever you want to work. And I can tell you, there's a lot of nicer places where, you know, where, where young millennials want to be rather than San Francisco because the cost of the rent in San Francisco or New York skyrocket. It's expensive. It's hard to live and all that. So we're going to live in a, in a workforce that's spread all over the place. However, there will be a need for offices. So this is why, why uh, WeWork is basically, uh, you know, I'll give you one perfect example. You know, a very large company in New York City says, please find me buildings that are close to the main train stations. Mm -hmm. I myself, why? And they say, because we want to give our employees the ability to just take one train into the city and so they can avoid the subway. And this needs to be, so therefore, we're putting our buildings now close to train station, not subway station, but big train stations that come from the suburbs. So that's, that's changing because people have serious concerns over the potential propagation of the virus that we will have on the subway. So everything is changing. And, and I'll give you a few things that are you know, quite in, in, interesting. You know, as, as you probably know, I'm also in the sports industry. Yes. You know, I own a, I own a couple soccer of soccer team. teams. And... That's changing so fast because we don't anticipate full stadiums for a while 
until the until the virus can be contained. But the whole world is changing to provide an amazing experience without public. But when you're looking at our home, you think the stadium is full. You have that that same feeling. So that's something that we had to we had to reimagine and rechange real fast. We look at our uh, our e-commerce businesses. Our e-commerce businesses are thriving, right? Uh, you know, our food delivery businesses are is you know they're all thriving. Uh, our online education business that we have invested, or, or education platform, are thriving. Our online medical care companies that we have invested are thriving. Or brick and mortar are suffering. Right. Your traditional brick and mortar or hospitality businesses are suffering a little bit. So it's quite interesting how this world is changing how fast entrepreneurs are adapting to a new world. So you mentioned your soccer teams. You've talked about WeWork. You've talked about the Latin America Fund. You've talked about the Opportunity Fund. You're also SoftBank International, not just Latin America, uh, you know, uh, head. So the very important question is, when do you sleep? This, this came you know, from I, someone in South Africa, wants to know when you sleep. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you my view on this, right? And this is my personal growth, right? As we mature and as we've been through a few of this, your initial thinking is you jump in into the business, you try to make changes fast and all that. And in my new job, I took a, I took a step back and I say, how can I be better, right? And I can be better by actually staying behind hiring incredible CEOs to run our businesses. I manage over 71 businesses. I have over 71 CEOs. And that allows me to basically have a broader view of what's going on. It allows me to be a more effective leader by helping Sandeep turn around WeWork, by helping Simon, in the CEO of Arm, you know, which is, is one of our great companies, do great, by helping Mike Siebert, who's our CEO at T-Mobile now, you know, and I act as a board member, so I've learned that I am a much better leader today by stepping back and not jumping into the crisis. When I need to jump into the crisis, I can jump in. I jump into WeWork. I, ju- I was there for 90 days, put a plan, hire a CEO and all that. So believe it or not, if you're surrounded yourself with amazing leaders who are much better than you, right? You can find a lot of time to sleep, to exercise and to do all the things that I'm trying to do while still running you know, a, a, a conglomerate of investments, operating companies, funds, and so on. So this is a time when a lot of leaders are, are in, introspective. And so apart from delegating, it sounds like, and trusting other people, like what, what have you learned about yourself? What, what's, people want to know what's going to drive your own happiness and success going forward? And what maybe have you learned isn't working so well and you're changing? And I think that uh, because this is something that all of us as leaders are, are, are being introspective about. So, so probably the biggest change is to understand that you don't need to jump into a problem immediately and just jump into the battle zone. And that was my style, right? I went in and I needed to do everything so fast and, and make all the changes. You know, I think I've learned to think more, to take my time, to plan better. Uh, and that works a lot better for me now, right? And I'm trying to do that, right? Because I, I face crises every day. And what I learned is that sometimes if you take a step back and get all the facts and do more thinking, you will arrive to a better solution than what happens to every entrepreneur, that we think we're capable of solving anything, that we just jump in. We don't like the CMO, move them out. I'll do the marketing. I don't like the CFO, move them out. I'll do the books. That was my style. And when I went into Sprint, that's what I did. When I went to other companies that I fixed, that's what I did. I'm much better now taking my time, planning, and then have a clear plan. And I'm, I'm, I'm working on that. And that, that's working so good for me. Uh, what has worked also for me, great, you know, I, I, I always say that out of every crisis, there's something great. And the greatness here is having being stuck with my wife and my six kids at home every day has taught me a whole new thing about parenting, has taught me that I actually love this part of my life and, and that there's no need for me when there's a crisis in Singapore to go run to the airport to take the next plane. There's no reason that I cannot do that meeting in Zoom and I'll probably achieve the same. So 
lots of good learnings, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of positive things um, uh, yeah. with the crisis. Yeah, business travel, right? I mean, who's going to go for public board meetings, you know, flying around, right? When you, when Zoom works. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we've all learned that. So before I, I allow you to give sort of closing thoughts to all the entrepreneurs, I have to ask you, so uh, politics ever in your future? You know, I try not to. I mean, running the largest Bolivian soccer team that I own, Club Bolivar, which 40% of the team, the, the country belongs to, but to that team, <clears throat> it's enough politics having to fight with yeah. the other. That's how Mockery got so. started, right? <laughs> So, so I have at this point, and people ask me all the time. I have no, I have so much to do, and I have so much to achieve within my personal and professional life. That at this point in time, I have pushed away anybody that has tried to convince me to become the next president of Bolivia. Which there's not a single day that they don't come to try to convince me of that. But I, you know, I, I, I'm happy. I'm super happy what I'm doing. You should know we're good friends, of course, with uh, with Martina Scobari of uh, General Atlantic, and he yeah. calls himself the number two Bolivian behind you. <laughs> yeah, Martina's a good guy. He's, he's smart. A uh, he's a good investor. So as, as we started to learn Latin America, he was, uh, you know, he's been a, I'll tell you, even Tom Martin, he's been my mentor in investing in Latin America. So before I make any investment, I call Martin. I say, what do you think? I also got to know that he's also investing, going after the same deals, but his knowledge has been, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of Martin. You know, he's, a, yes. he's incredibly bright and he's made some amazing investments. And I think we all have a lot to learn from Martin. Exactly. All right. So what are your parting thoughts? This has been so wonderful to get to hear all of your stories, but if you had parting thoughts to all the entrepreneurs uh, calling from all over the world, what would you like to end with? So, so my, my parting thoughts is nobody should get discouraged. These have been some difficult times that just makes us stronger. They're testing our ability to the maximum that we can. I mean, uh, some of our businesses have decreased their revenue by 80%, and nobody could have ever predicted that. But if you can manage through crisis, you can manage through anything. And this is the moment to take tough decisions that otherwise you wouldn't take. But trust me, when this crisis goes by, I, I went through Brighter through a 2009 financial crisis, and I was able to run through that. 2011, 12, 13, I was unstoppable because I, was, I had learned how to manage through crisis. Take the tough decisions now. If you gotta reduce cost, if you, it's fine, it's okay. Nobody's gonna judge you in that because you're running, you're trying to run a business. But those entrepreneurs that know how to manage through crisis are gonna thrive after the crisis. There are some that won't be able to make it because they don't know how to manage through crisis. But those that do, those that know how to take these tough decisions, Trust me, you're about to build the world's best company. So, and I look forward to continue to work with all of you on Endeavor. Keep on associating yourself with the best entrepreneurs. And in us, you're going to find a partner who's always going to be behind you. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Perfect way to end. Mwah. Thank you. Everybody have a great day.